All right, good morning. So um, before we get started today, because we are going to move on to a new section, um, any comments, questions, concerns, anything we need to address? Um, just a reminder, there is a homework due tonight by midnight if you haven't finished that one yet. Um, so definitely send me questions on that one if you've got any, because um, I can answer those. Um, I do have a lot of advising appointments this afternoon and even tonight, so I don't know if I'll be able to get in an office hour today. Um, but, you know, definitely email me if you've got questions. Um, we'll try to work through that. Anybody, any questions before we get started today? The other thing I do want to mention, um, if you look on Blackboard, I posted an announcement um, this morning that test three has been posted. Um, so take a look at that. Um, it gives you the directions for how to access the test, what to do with the test. Um, it's going to be due next Tuesday night by midnight. Um, so you've got basically a week to work on that. Um, but let me know for sure if you have any questions about that. Um, the section we're doing today is the last section for this unit. Um, so we'll finish up everything that you will need for the test today. Um, I am still going to take a day to review. Um, so hopefully tomorrow, I think we'll probably get through most everything I need to today um, in this section. Um, so probably either tomorrow or Friday we'll review for the test, um, but it won't be due until Tuesday at midnight. Any questions about that right now? This is 3.7. Yes, Savannah. And like I said, this will be the last section we do. Um, I don't think there are actually any homework questions um, on this section, which is why the homework is still due tonight. Um, I think everything in that homework is actually from 3.5 and 3.6. Um, so you should be able to do it just based off the stuff that we finished up yesterday. This technically is somewhat of a review um, because it's similar to something we did back in chapter one, um, but I think it's good to kind of go back and reiterate how to do these because again, something like this could show up on the final exam also. Any other questions? All right, so like I said, if you have any questions either on the homework or about the test or anything like that, feel free to email me um, you know, as you're looking at it, um, and I'll definitely get back to you and answer those kind of questions. Or if you want to ask me during class tomorrow, um, if you run into any issues, that'll be great. All right, so 3.7, polynomial and rational inequalities. All right, so this is what we mean by a polynomial inequality. All right, so everything's in polynomial form, right? There are no fractions or anything like that. But we do have an inequality because we have this greater than or equal to this time. Right? So we're going to look at how we can solve this. So I'll give you a chance to write that down first. All right, so in this case, whenever it's a polynomial like this, the first thing we're always going to want to do is get zero on one side. Okay, so just like if we were solving a polynomial equation, we would want to set it equal to zero. That's what we want to do here. So what would we need to do to get zero on one side in equality? 13x, good. So I'm going to subtract 13x on both sides here. And there are no like terms on this side to combine with negative 13x, so I'm just going to rewrite everything. We've got 2x cubed plus x squared. I'm going to put the minus 13x next just to keep everything in order, and then the plus 6, and it's still greater than or equal to, and now this side becomes 0. Right. So that's always your first step is to get 0 on one side of your inequality. Now, once we've got that, what we want to do is we want to see if we can factor this thing that we have on the left-hand side. And in this case, because we have this x cubed, you could try factoring by grouping, but I'll go ahead and tell you because of the 13 and the 6, that's not going to work. Okay, so we're not going to be able to factor by grouping. So what would we need to do at this point if I want to know the zeros that come from this polynomial so that we can factor it? P's and Q's, good. All right, so we're going to identify our P and Q values. 
And so what would be the values of P for this one? Good, okay, so we have plus or minus one, plus or minus two, plus or minus three, and plus or minus six, right? Because we're looking at the factors of six here. That would be one, six, two, and three. So that's how we get this list of P values here. Now, what about the Q values for this one? So just plus or minus one and plus or minus two. Now, once we have our P's and Q's, remember we have to do our division. So we're gonna divide every P by every Q and see what all those combinations are. So what would that list of P divided by Q give us this time? All right, so we've got plus or minus one, plus or minus one half, plus or minus two, plus or minus three, plus or minus three halves, plus or minus six, and then we already had the three, right? Okay, so we don't need to repeat that one. So I think that should be our full list, right? Because one divided by one, that would be one. One divided by two would be one half. 2 divided by 1 would be 2, 2 divided by 2 would be the 1 which we already had, 3 divided by 1 would be 3, 3 divided by 2 is 3 halves, 6 divided by 1 is 6, 6 divided by 2 is 3 which we already had here, right? So that should be our full list of P divided by Q now. Now, once we have that list, notice here this is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 times 2, that's 12 different values that we could test. What would you want to do now so that we don't actually have to test all 12 of those values? Good, right? So let's look at our graph. I'm going to go into Desmos and graph this. And we're just going to graph the left-hand side as a polynomial equation, right? So just kind of ignore the inequality for now. So just y equals 2x cubed plus x squared minus 13x plus 6. So now let me share that graph. All right, so that's what our graph looks like. So now looking at the graph here, what values might we want to actually check? Okay, so negative three positive two, is there any other value that we might want to check here? One half looks like it could work, right? Okay, now in this case, because we started with x cubed, if we can get any one of these values to work, we'll have it down to a quadratic, and then we'll probably be able to factor anyway, right? Or use quadratic formula if nothing else. So these are the three we want to choose. So which one would you like to test first? All right, so we'll go with two then. Get back to my notes. There we go. All right, so we're gonna do our synthetic division now, right? So I'm gonna put two in the box here. Now we need our coefficients. So looking over here, x cubed, x squared, x, and no x at all. We're not missing any terms, so we can just go with the two, positive one, negative 13, 
and positive six. Bring down the two. Okay, so now if we multiply, two times two is four. Remember, we're always adding, so one plus four is going to give us five. Five times two is 10. Negative 13 plus 10 is negative three. Negative three times two is negative six, and six plus negative six should give us zero as the remainder. Okay, so that tells us now that two is one of our zeros, right? So that one checks it out. Now, what does this line down here give us now that we know that that's one of our zeros? Almost, right? So what's the coefficient of the x squared this time, though? Good. So it should be 2x squared plus 5x minus 3. Okay? Any questions up to that point there? All right. So now... Once we get it to this quadratic, now we can see if this thing factors. And again, if it doesn't factor, then we can always use quadratic formula. Can we factor 2x squared plus 5x minus 3? And if so, what would the factors be? Good. So this is going to give us 2x minus 1 times x plus 3. And now if we think about it, right, the 2x minus 1, what would be the 0 that would come from that factor? There's your 1 half, right, and that was one that we said could work. And then this one, the x plus 3, would give us what? Negative 3. And again, that was one of the other ones that we said could work, right? So this looks good now. So now we know that our zeros for this polynomial are going to be positive 2, positive 1 half, and negative 3. So that's our first goal, right, is once we get 0 by itself on one side, we find our p's and q's, we want to know what all the zeros are. Now, normally, right, if this was just an equation, we'd pretty much be done, right? Because we'd have all of our zeros, we'd have all of our factors, we'd be good to go. The problem here is we don't want to know where this thing equals zero, so we don't want to know the zeros of the polynomial. We want to know where this thing is greater than or equal to zero. So what we're going to have to do now, is we're going to draw a number line. And on that number line, we're going to list out all of our zeros. So in this case, the negative 3 is the smallest. So I'm going to put it down here. 1 half would be next. And then 2 is the largest of those three. Okay, so... Kenneth, your question is, wouldn't it just be two and one half? And I'm guessing you're asking that because of the greater than or equal to zero. So keep in mind here, it's not just we want X values that are greater than or equal to zero. We want whatever we plug in to this whole thing here to be greater than or equal to zero. And because we've got so many exponents and things going on here, it could be that plugging in some of these negative values actually become positive once we substitute them in. Okay. That's what we have to keep in mind. It's not that the x values need to be positive. It's that this whole polynomial needs to be positive. Okay? All right. So now what we're going to do is we're going to actually choose test points in each one of our intervals to see where this thing actually is positive and where is it negative. Okay? So I need a value that's somewhere to the left of negative 3. So what's a value I could choose to the 
left of negative three. Negative four works, okay? So I'm gonna choose negative four in that interval right there. Now, what we wanna do is we wanna plug in negative four to our polynomial to see is it positive or is it negative? So I'm gonna come back down here to this factored form because this is gonna be the easiest place to check that. So we have the two X minus one, the X plus three. What would be the last factor of this that comes from the two? Okay, so not negative 2x plus 1. So think about in this case, right, if we know two of our zeros, that's right, right, x minus 2 would have to be the factor here that would give us positive 2 as our zero, right? So we know now that x minus 2 is going to be that last factor. We have 2x minus 1, x plus 3, x minus 2. These are the factors of that original polynomial that we started with. So now we want to take the negative 4. And I'm going to plug it into each one of these to determine where is it positive and where is it negative. So if I take my negative 4 and I plug it in here, 2 times negative 4 minus 1, is that going to be positive or negative? It's going to be negative, right? And that's all I care about. I don't care what the value is so long as I know if it's positive or negative. Then I'm going to do negative 4 plus 3. So is that going to be positive or negative? also negative. Then I'm going to do negative 4 minus 2. Is that going to be positive or negative? Also negative. So now if I have three negatives here, when I multiply that together, is it going to be positive or negative? That should be negative overall, which means everything in this interval down here now to the left of negative 3, we're going to have a negative. And if you remember way back to chapter one, this is where we did the big table and we put all the intervals in there and we did each of our factors, right? I'm trying to do it without creating the entire table this time. Um, but if you want to use the table, feel free, right? Because then you'd have three negatives and the overall answer would be negative, right? Now I want to choose a value somewhere between negative three and one half. So what value could I choose in that interval? Zero, right? So anytime you can choose zero, that's an easy one to substitute in. And zero would be in that interval. So now I'm going to come back to my factors here, erase these. So again, I'm going to plug in zero to each factor just to see what we get. So if I plug in zero to the first one, is that going to be negative or positive? Should be negative. Good. Zero plus three is going to be positive. And then zero minus two should be negative. So now I have a negative times a positive times a negative. That should be what overall? Good. So remember, if there's an even number of negatives, overall, the answer should come out as a positive value there. So now we know everything in the interval from negative 3 to 1 half should be positive. Any questions on how we got that? All right. Now I need something between one half and two. So what value do you check there? One works. So again, I'm coming back to my factors. I'm gonna think about where is it negative, where is it positive? So if I plug in one to this first factor, give us a positive value. Good. Plug in one, we get a positive, and one minus two is gonna be negative. So overall that's gonna be negative. Perfect. Okay. Okay. And then finally, we need a value somewhere to the right of two. So what we use there, three works. Substitute that in. I'm not going to erase it. So we get the first one's going to be positive. Second one's going to be positive. Last one's going to be positive this time. Three positives make a positive value. Okay. Now, any questions just on the number line, how we tested, how we got the positive and negatives? All 
All right. So now, since we want this to be greater than or equal to zero, do we want the positive values or the negative values? We want positives, right? Because positive values will be greater than or equal to zero. So that means I'm looking at everything in this interval and everything in this interval. That's what we care about. So now we just have to list out those intervals. So what would be the interval where this is positive here then? How would you write that interval? Okay, so we're going from negative three to positive one half. And so now the only question is, are we including the negative three and the one half or are we not including the negative three and the one half, right? So remember, this was greater than or equal to zero, right? So would the negative three make it greater than or equal to zero? Okay. So think about it down here, right? X plus three was one of our factors. Negative three was one of our zeros. Therefore, at negative three, the value will be equal to zero. Therefore, we do need to include negative three. Okay. So that's how we have to kind of think through this is that negative three going to make this inequality true. And since it makes it equal to zero, it is a true statement there. So we do want to include negative three. What about the one half then? Are we going to include it or not? So would the one half make it greater than or equal to zero? Right. So in this case, one half is also one of our zeros, right? Therefore, it will make it equal zero. So again, the one half needs to be included in our answer. Any questions on why we include those? Now, if this had just been a greater than instead of a greater than or equal to, that's when we would have parentheses here because then we would not want to include those values that make it zero. Okay? But because of the equals here, that means we do want to include those endpoints okay? because those will make it equal zero. Now, do we have any other intervals where this thing would be positive? Okay, so almost, not three to infinity, but what? Good, All right? So make sure we're using the number down here on the number line, right? So we want to go from 2 to infinity. And again, because 2 is one of the zeros, that will make it equal 0. Therefore, we want to include it in our answer this time. And then because we have different intervals here, I'm just going to stick a unit in between those. So this would be our final answer for this one. It's every value between negative 3 and 1 half and every value from 2 to infinity. All of that is the solution to that original inequality now. Any questions on any of those steps? All right. Now, I want to put the graph back up there real quick because I just want to show you a nice way to kind of check your solution here. Because again, like on a test or an exam, I would actually want to see all of that work. But if we look at this graph now, what we're trying to find is where is this polynomial greater than or equal to zero? So we want to basically know where is it positive? Well, if we look at the graph here, everything that's positive would be anything above the x-axis. So if we can figure out those intervals where we're above the x-axis, that'll tell us if our solution is correct. 
Well, we got negative three to positive one half as one of our intervals. If you look at your graph now, I'm gonna try to highlight these points. So there's negative three, there's one half. Everything between those values now on your graph is above the x-axis, right? And then I can zoom out so you can actually see the whole thing if you want. Okay, but everything in between those two values is above the x-axis. Then the only other place that we're also above the x-axis now is everything from positive two all the way to infinity, right? So all of that stuff is gonna be above the x-axis also. So that's why two to infinity is also part of our solution. The other intervals here are all below the x-axis that are gonna give you negative values. So we know we don't want to do in our solution. Just a quick way to kind of check yourself just to make sure that the intervals you got there is being greater than or equal to zero or actually above the x-axis on your graph. Any questions on that? All right. Anybody need more time to get any of that work before I move on to the next one? Okay. I'm actually going to skip over this one because I want to make sure we do. Okay, so now we have a rational inequality because we have fraction with X's in the denominator this time. All right, so first step, still the same. So what would we want to do first here? Good, we need to move the one to the other side, right? So we got to subtract one from both sides. So I'm just going to write this, keep the fraction, one minus two X over X squared minus 2x minus 3. I'm subtracting the 1, and now it's going to be greater than or equal to 0. So no matter what, when you have an inequality like this, whether it's a polynomial or a rational function, you get 0 on one side first. Now, once we've done that, we want to be able to put all of this together into a single fraction. If I want to create a single fraction out of what I have on the left-hand side now, what are we going to have to do? So before we can factor, we need to do something else first. So think about how would I combine this fraction that we have here with this minus one that we just moved to that side. common denominator. Good, right? So if we find the common denominator here, since this is the only thing that even has a fraction, right? The x squared minus 2x minus 3, that's going to be our common denominator. I'm going to keep the first fraction the same. And now you want x squared minus 2x minus 3 in my denominator here for the one, what's the numerator gonna have to be for that one? OK, 
Okay, so you said same but negative. Okay, so it's going to be exactly what we have down here, right? Because I'm bringing down the minus sign and I need this fraction to be equal to one, which means I need exactly the same thing on top and bottom here, right? So this is going to be x squared minus 2x minus 3 because that divided by itself would give us a 1 there. Any questions on how I got that fraction? Okay. Now this is still greater than or equal to 0. And the whole purpose for finding that combinator is so that I can now put these two fractions together. So if I combine what's in the numerators here, what should that numerator be now? Almost. So just be careful here. So we're subtracting the x squared. Okay? And so this is going to give us negative x squared. And then the 1 minus the negative 3 is going to be a plus 4. Okay? So negative 2x minus negative 2x, that becomes a positive. So those cancel out. So this is what we're going to have for the numerator now. Okay. Sorry, Sarah, you said it cut out. Are we back together now? Good. Okay. All right. So now that's what we should get numerator once we combine those. What's our denominator going to be now? Good. Right. So we just keep the common denominator. So it's x squared minus 2x minus 3. Again, still greater than or equal to 0. Any questions up to that point? All right. Now, once we've got it into a single fraction, that's where we can start to factor. So let's look at our numerator here. Let's see if we can find factors that will give us negative x squared plus 4. Okay, so Sarah says negative on the outside and then x plus 2, x minus 2. That works, right? So we can actually do it that way. The only reason I'm not going to is because I find that when people put that negative on the outside, when we go to do our number line, they forget it, and, they, and then they screw up all their signs. And so I'm going to actually do this as just negative x plus 2 and positive x plus 2 which is exactly the same as what you've got here, except I've distributed that negative into one of my sets, basically this one, right? If you do that, that would give us a negative x and a positive two. So I'm going to keep it that way in system. Okay. So what you have there is correct, Sarah. Um, in terms of just finding our signs later, 
it's easier if we just have it in this factored form instead. Okay? Now, what about the denominator? Okay, so x minus 3 and x plus 1. That looks good. <clears throat> And again, still greater than or equal to zero now. Now, once we've got it in factored form, what we want to figure out is what are going to be the values that would actually give us each of these factors that we've got, right? And we care about both the numerator and the denominator this time. So I'm going to take every single factor, I'm going to set it equal to zero, and I'm going to find those x values. So my first factor here is negative x plus 2. And set that equal to zero. And we have the x plus two, set it equal to zero. The x minus three equals zero, and the x plus one equals zero. Okay, and Kenneth Good, so the first one here, once we solve that, that's gonna give us positive x equals two. What do we get for the next one? Good, x equals negative two. The x minus 3 would give us positive 3. Good. And finally, the x plus would be negative 1. So once you get everything together and you get everything factored, set each one of those factors equal to 0 to figure out what those numbers are going to be. Because now these are going to be the numbers that we're actually going to put on our number line to find those test points. I'm going to draw my number line. This time we've got four values, so make sure you put them in order. Negative 2 is the smallest. Negative 1 would be next. 2 would be the next one. And then 3 would be the largest. Now, just like the last problem, now we're going to do some test points. So, what could we use that would be to the left of negative 2? Negative 3 works. So now we're going to take that negative 3 and we're going to plug it back into our inequality. And I'm going to plug it into this factored form over here just to figure where is it positive, where is it negative. Right? Look at the first factor here. When I get negative 3, negative, negative 3 plus 2 is going to give us what kind of value? Good, because a negative negative 3 becomes positive 3. 3 plus 2 is 5. This is going to be a positive value. What about negative 3 plus 2? It's going to be negative. Good. Negative 3 minus 3 is going to be be careful there. So negative 3 minus 3. Right, because that's going to give us negative 6, so that's actually a negative value down there. And then negative 3 plus 1 would be negative 4. Good. So now we have to look at how many negatives we have overall. So we have three negatives overall. That's an odd number of negatives. So what should we get for this answer over here then? Should be negative. Good. So just remember, odd number of negatives makes it negative, and even number of negatives would make it positive instead. Any questions there? All right, so what value could we choose between negative 1 and negative 2? So let's see, so negative one half would actually be to the right of negative one, right? Because it would be closer to zero. So what value would actually be between negative one and negative two here? Negative 1.5 or negative three halves, right? Either way you want to think of that. I'll do it as a decimal, so negative 1.5. And so now we're going to plug that value into each of our factors over here. Uh, 
And so the first one here, we're going to have a negative, negative 1.5 plus, so what would that give us? That's going to be positive. Good. Negative 1.5 plus 2 is going to be positive. Negative 1.5 minus 3 would be negative. And negative 1.5 plus 1, still going to be negative. Overall, then, this thing should be what? Positive, because we have two negatives. That's an even number of negatives. We have a positive value overall. So I'm going to let you try the last three intervals here, right? So pick something between negative 1 and 2, something between 2 and 3, something between 3 and infinity. Test those values, see what you get for your signs, and then we'll come back together and we'll check that. And I'll let you try those first. All right, so even if you're not done, okay, let's go ahead and look at these. So what value did somebody choose between negative 1 and 2? Zero, okay. And so when you did zero, you said you got a negative value. And that is correct, okay. Any questions on how we got a negative value for that interval there? And then Sarah said she used 2.5 for the next interval. That would be between 2 and 3. Good. And so you said when we did that, you ended up with a positive value. And that would be correct. So any questions on how we got a positive value for that interval? Right. And then what value did somebody use up here in the last interval then? Four. Okay. So if we do four then, when we plug that in over here, what should we end up with for that interval? Good. So that one should come out as a negative. 
Because in this case, the only one that's going to be negative would be the negative 4 plus 2. Everything else should come out of positive. So we only have one negative. So that's going to give us a negative overall here. All right. Now, once we have our number line and we have all of the positives and negatives, now we have to go back and figure out, well, do we want the positives or do we want the negatives? Which one do we want this time? Good, right? We want this to be greater than or equal to zero. Therefore, we only want the positive values. So I want everything in this interval here and everything in that interval right there. Now we just have to figure out what the overall intervals are going to look like and we'll have our solution. So you got negative two, negative one. I'm going to write down exactly what you've got here, union, and then from two to three. Okay. I'll tell you that's about 75% correct. About what's wrong with it, okay? Asbel's got it, right? So there are going to be restrictions on this because we have a denominator this time, right? So we have to be very careful in what we're including and what we're not. So if we think back to this fraction over here, which values can we not actually include in our answer? Okay, we cannot include the three, right? Because that's plus zero in the denominator. We also can't include negative one because that would also make the denominator equal to zero, right? So we'll come back over here now. We have to make sure that the negative one is not going to be included. And we also have to make sure that the positive three is not going to be included. The negative two and the positive two are fine because those came from the numerator and the numerator can be equal to zero. It's just that we can't have zero in the denominator, which is why we cannot include those two values this time. So that's really the only difference between the first one we did with the polynomial and this one with the rational function is once we get our answer, we just have to go back and think about those restrictions in the denominator and make sure we're not including those values. Okay. Any questions on that one now? All right, so that's a good stopping point. Okay, so that's where we'll wrap up for the day. Um, again, if you have any questions about the test that I posted or if you have any questions about the homework that's due tonight, um, please do let me know. Um, definitely email me. Um, again, I don't know if I'm going to have the time this afternoon to set up an office hour um, just because I do have a lot of advising appointments for registration that's coming up next week. Um, but definitely email me with questions because I can definitely at least respond to you um, with email. Give me those questions through WebAssign and I can respond to you there. Any questions before we go? All right, well, thank you for coming. I'll hang out for a few more minutes just in case you think of anything, um, but have a good afternoon and I will see you tomorrow.